you hear Zoe barking? Yeah. <laughs> She's getting excited about something. <laughs> Good to see everybody here. And, and just for quick background, we're DK and Mishti from the Highlighter team, and we're building Highlighter as a place to gather to read and discuss great writing. And these town halls are a way to bring writers into the mix to jam with us and dig deeper on their ideas. We've recently been doing a few sessions with online writers like Tamaz, uh, who've been publishing blogs, and in this case, publishing nearly daily for years. Uh, so it's like a, a big, you know, a deep, rich uh, uh, body of work uh, that we've been kind of reading together. Yeah, really impressive, especially with five kids. <laughs> we definitely want to get into that. <laughs> but um, we're going to springboard off of Tom's recent piece on narrative economics and its application to the tech world. And I think lots of people have written about how stories are a really important force in the world. Like they can help us cooperate with many strangers, Harari says. Um, Schiller, who you mentioned, talks about how they can trigger economic crises. So, but also as an individual VC yourself, I'm sure you think a lot about kind of like your own story and building your own brand. So I think um, Tomas will have a lot to say on writing and decision making and career transitions. So feel free to chime in to ask him questions about any of these topics. And quick note on the format. So the magic of the town hall that we host here is when we keep it really participatory. So, uh, you know, we've got plenty of questions we could fill up uh, to ask Tomas ourselves, but um, we'll kick it off. But but we really encourage you to chime in with ideas and questions. And the best way to do that is um, just pop over on the chat and you can start asking questions there. And then we'll invite you up to kind of ask live and discuss with, with Tomas. And then um, just as an FYI, we are recording the session and we're streaming it live to YouTube and we're making a video so the people who couldn't attend tonight can still join and learn from our discussion uh, asynchronously. Yep, awesome. And we're going to hand it over to Rick to intro uh, Tomaz actually and kick us off. But before that, I just have a question for everyone on chat, which is, I know a lot of you are also writers. So what would your top question for Tom be, who has written nearly daily for many years now? So chime in on chat. And with that, I'll hang, hand it off to Rick. All right, thanks. So Tom, when I saw you were going to be a guest today, I reached out to David and I said, I'd be happy to do an intro for you. Oh, thank uh, you so much. <laughs> I'm honored. Yeah, Tom and I go back um, about a decade and, and I'll talk about that just after I do your bio. So let me start with that. So my pleasure to introduce uh, Tom. Tom's managing director at Redpoint. He's a, a prolific blogger and the co-author of Winning with Data, which explores the cultural changes big data brings to business and shows you how to adapt your organization to leverage data to maximum effect. Before joining Redpoint, Tom was a product manager for Google's AdSense, as he just mentioned under Sheryl Sandberg. Uh, Tom attended Dartmouth College, where he rode on the, on the crew team and graduated as a George Revitz Fellow with a BA in Mechanical Engineering and a BE in Machine Learning and a Master's Degree in Engineering Management. So uh, we go back about a decade. Um, Redpoint had led a uh, Series B in my company, Branch Out, that I had founded. And uh, Tom was a board observer with uh, Jeff Yang from Redpoint, the actual, the, the one of the, the co-founder, I think, of Redpoint, Jeff Yang. That's right. Uh, yeah. on, on my board. And, you know, one thing that I really appreciated about Tom, and you were probably only about 29 or 30 back then. I mean, this is a while back. Um, is that, you know, we had a pretty active board. Uh, Jeff's a big deal. Kevin Effersey from Excel. We had Tim Chang from Mayfield and Stan Chanowski from who's uh, now, you know, a senior leader at Facebook and myself. So you had some loud people in the room. And Tom was smart enough to stay out of the fray, but would always come up to me at the end of the board meeting and kind of pull me aside with some very thoughtful notes. And, uh, and I always appreciate that about you, Tom, that you were, um, you know, always thinking about the company, always trying to figure out what you could do to help the company in your own way. So thank you for all of that and for, you know, for the friendship over the last 10 years. And, uh, and I talked to Ryan Sarver today and he also wanted to say hello to you. Oh, no way. That's awesome. That's great. What a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed my time working with you too. Yes, thank you. So with that, I'll hand it uh, back to, uh, I guess, to, to David and, and sure. Tom and take it from you. Yeah, well, I can, I can kick off with a question. I know, I know I already see a lot of other questions coming up in the chat, but, um, but just, uh, just to kind of kick it off, you know, I, 
I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about your writing routine, because I think given how many writers there are around us and how people are sort of building new habits, I think it helps us all to learn a little bit from somebody who's got, you know, a decade of experience and what has worked and what has shifted. And how do you think about your, your routines around writing? Yeah, for sure. So I, I think uh, the first thing is I, I write really early in the morning and that's when no one can bother you and you're just kind of facing the page. Uh, the second thing is I give myself a time limit and whatever is published or written then goes out. Um, and so you kind of get used to like, right, you give yourself like 60 minutes, uh, that's what I do. And the, the third thing that's really important is there's a, there's a McKinsey framework that I use a lot, which is called situation, complication, question and answer. And I've written a blog post about it. And it's just a way of structuring a lot of nonfiction really effectively, which is here's the situation, here's a complication, what question does it raise, what's the answer? And you repeat that for four paragraphs and you summarize and there's your blog post, right? So let's make an example. Um, uh, situation, um, situation is the world is operating normally. Complication, uh, you know, coronavirus happens. Question, uh, what does that mean for uh, the cactus in the office? right? Here's mm. my answer, right? And oh. uh, you summarize the answer and then you have three supporting bullet points and you do SCQA, 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 and then you summarize. And so if you go back through a lot of my blog posts, that's exactly the format that they follow. And the idea is to bring all of the interesting stuff to the top because it's super important in uh, blogging to write um, New York Times. Uh, there's an awesome book on how to write uh, written by the former editor of the New York Times where he talks about pyramid structure, which is you want to put all the most important stuff at the top. And you kind of think like you're giving away um, the reason people are there, but uh, people, if they're interested, will read. And uh, for me, the average reader stays 48 seconds. And so I only have 48 seconds with that reader. So if I'm going to give them value, I got to give them value in the first paragraph. So that's the third thing I think about. And uh, there was a, um, and then the, the last thing I'll actually, the, uh, number four is you really have to understand your audience. And the point that somebody made to me um, was that the very best content marketers like 20 years ago or even today are the television show, the networks. And if you think about like the mm -hmm. day in the life of like an NBC, you have cartoons in the morning for the kids, then news, then uh, soap operas, then game shows, then news, then like primetime. And what they've basically done there is identified each persona when they're watching, when, and then created content for each. And so um, that's what I try to do. Some days I write for product managers, some days I write for engineers, some days I write for CEOs, some days I write for LPs. Uh, and you'll see that there's you know, quite a bit of variety. And then there was also another question, which is who do you write for? And you, you, I write to educate other people, but ultimately I'm really, it's kind of a selfish thing. Uh, it's, um, it's a selfish thing because it has to be a selfish thing. If you write exclusively for other people, you, um, you forget the joy of writing and it becomes a chore and it, it becomes harder. Uh, and I'll, I'll give you, um, two stories. The first is I used to look at my Google analytics traffic all the time and that totally sapped all the fun out of writing. And then, um, then I started reading a bunch of fiction and I was like, okay, I really like Hemingway. Let me write a bunch of blog posts in the style of Hemingway. I really like Herman Hesse. Let me write a bunch of blog posts in the style of Herman Hesse. But these so are I still nonfiction Faulkner. tech oriented, but in the style of Herman Hesse. Yeah. And so like I've been reading the letters mm -hmm. of um, Freeman Dyson, who is this amazing physicist. And um, he likes to write with lots of semicolons. And the, the funny thing is like Hemingway brought really short writing uh, to, the Eng to English. Mm -hmm. And he brought really short writing because he actually wrote a lot about sports. And when you read like the summary of a, whatever, an MLB game, it's really short and to the point. And so that kind of characterized his fiction writing. Whereas if you read like a Faulkner or you read like a Freeman Dyson, you realize like English can have these incredibly long sentences if they're constructed the right way. And they're just as easy to read as Hemingway, but you have to mm -hmm. work at it. And so it's like, okay, let me talk about an interesting topic that's going on in the software world, but let me do it in the style of, so you have to have fun with it. 
So will we see those fingerprints if we go back on those those blog posts. We can kind of try to play uh, guess the author. <laughs> yeah, so you'd be like, oh, that was his Hemingway era. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds like the the formula you used from from McKinsey. It, it kind of reminds me of like in fiction. I've talked to people who do a lot of like kind of hobbyist fiction. They often study like the hero's journey. It's just a nice kind of a formula for writing fiction that has all the right components and gets you oriented. So in a sense. Is, is this McKinsey framework is sort of like the hero's journey for nonfiction? Yeah, totally. And it was Elad Gill who introduced me to it. So e Elad oh, and right? I used to, yeah, used to work together on the same floor. And uh, I had heard about this book. It's called The Minto Pyramid Principle from um, another manager, uh, Tom Pickett, hmm. who's ex McKinsey. And so, uh, you know, he, he kind of turned me on to it and I was able to get a copy of the book. And that's Were you at McKinsey with Elad? Is that where you work on the same floor? No, that was no, no, no. We were at Google. Afterwards. Okay, cool. Yeah, Google Building 42, the third floor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. That's awesome. Um, um, Laura, can you jump in? Laura had a question on kind of identifying your audience, too. Are you there, Laura? Yeah. Oh, should I say it out loud? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So awesome. you're mentioning that, you know, you some days it's for product managers, some days for engineers. Do you tell the audience who it's for, or are they just kind of like how how as I, if I'm a, an engineer, how do I know that today's for me? It's typically in the title, right? So like the most recent one for engineers was uh, Will Larson's book on how to how to structure and run engineering teams, and so the title was something like um, I forget what it is, but it's like how to run the um, the best book I've ever written on engineering management or something like that. Um, so it's pretty clear from the title and what you what you find is that there's some subset of the readers in like the MailChimp list of the 40,000 people that will read it, just kind of depending. And so what you're trying to do is you're not going to be able to hit everybody every day, but if you can activate them like once a week or once every other week, then you're doing a good job sort of building the list and keeping people engaged. Who were you writing for when you originally started? Did you have a prototype of what the audience who might be interested or did you want to use writing as a vehicle to accomplish a particular goal? Yeah, there, so um, I was, when I first started at Redpoint, I desperately wanted to be a VC for a long time. And I was totally terrified of failing. And so I read as many of the Harvard Business Review books and articles on how to start a job as I could. And there was one in particular, uh, um, it's like, I forget the title, but it's something like, be so good they can't ignore you. And the whole premise of the book is when you start a new job, find something that you do better than anybody else inside the firm that's super, or inside the company that's super important, and then you will be unfireable, right? And <laughs> at the time, I was um, uh, compiling the news every week for the partnership. So on at partner meetings, after we go through the pipeline of all the investable partnership opportunities, uh, we went through like, okay, what was the news of the week? And so this actually took quite a bit of time. And so I started publishing those every Monday and that sort of drove a cadence. And then um, I was attached to the hip of some of the founders of Redpoint. And um, there were all these questions that were kind of popping up in board meetings that seemed to me like very answerable questions, but we weren't yet at a point in the time of the industry where we were kind of talking about like benchmarks or standards or like, Hey, what, you know, what does a typical series A look like? What did the revenue per employee look like? What should payback period look like? And we had all these like rules of thumb and, but there was nothing published. And so I started to write about those. And um, the amazing part about being a venture capitalist and why I'm so grateful for the role is you get to learn from the people who do it directly. And so, you know, I would ask people like, hey, can I write about this idea? Can I write about that idea? And so that's how it worked. And there was no traffic for like a year, um, I remember. Hmm. And then there were these sort of like seminal blog posts where it was just like, okay, number one, Hacker News, 25,000 views, all of a sudden the subscription list goes up by a ton or like a profile in Crunchbase or something like that. And then little by little. So, so you'd done a, almost a year of just writing without a ton of feedback? Yeah, it was like 25 of... page views a day or something. Wow. And, and what was the, there and wasn't I, really a culture yeah. of writing at Redpoint? Like, there, were there other partners who had done any blogging before? Or no, no real expectation of what that should look like? No, it was really early. I mean, there was, there was Fred Wilson, you know, who's like, 
the icon mm -hmm. of, you know, Brad Feld was writing a lot. And then uh, Dave Hornick had written a bunch. Mm -hmm. And those were, those were, I think, the, the blogs that existed. I'm sure there are others that I'm forgetting about. Could you talk more and then about, I, yeah. Could you talk more about the inflection points also? Like you mentioned getting picked up by other outlets, but kind of for people who are like really slogging away, we've heard this a couple of times, I think, like consistency being key, but then there are a couple of things that really help you, help your audience take off. Like, what was that for you? Yeah, for sure. So uh, another piece of advice is to be very consistent and be explicit about the, the consistency. And at the beginning, I wrote five days a week because I wanted to make sure that every time somebody came, there was something new. Um, and the other reason to do it is that there is a compounding, compounding interest works for SEO. So the more, if I have like one page that's compound, the traffic is compounding at a percent uh, a year or 2% a year, 10% a year, that's gonna grow at a certain cadence. But if I have a thousand pages and they're all compounding at a lower rate, I'm gonna grow way faster in terms of traffic. And so the idea was to generate as much of that as possible. There were a couple of blog posts that so then what I started to do is uh, try to optimize Hacker News and Twitter and all that kind of stuff uh, in the early days. And uh, the, what you, so um, I started uh, recirculate, so let's go content channel by content channel. So on Twitter, in order to drive a lot of traffic on Twitter, you just have to engage with other people and then they'll engage with you. That's the trade that happens on that social network. And so if you retweet stuff, people will retweet stuff on your behalf. And if you started to have, like in that era, people had real conversations on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, and th that drove a lot. Um, and then I started advertising the content on Twitter. So I started buying Twitter ads to see if that would drive anything. Um, then I, I tried cross posting. Um, and that doesn't really work because every publication that has a lot of traffic really wants net new content. And so like I tried cross posting with Inc uh, and Seeking Alpha and TechCrunch, but it, given the writing cadence that I had, I would just write and publish. It was sort of frustrating to wait on somebody else's editorial process to publish. Um, and so that didn't really work. But if you're starting from scratch, I would highly recommend and does, being more did patient than I am. In that era, would that be, would cross posting in that era, were you, both writing on your own blog as well as on the media pubs blog. Yeah, but they don't like that because it, that. It, it messes up the SEO. I, I would publish right. the same day. They really don't like okay. that. They, they want like a three day or a seven day or a, a four week delay. And mm -hmm. they want, um, they want all the SEO to come to them, you know, because distribution right. is their value, but right. I was looking for distribution. Right. Um, and so then it was, then I focused just on hacker news and trying to get to the top of hacker news and, um, I didn't use any nefarious techniques, like there are all kinds of voting rings and all that kind of stuff. I just, um, I would just publish consistently and, and people started to upvote it. And so there were, the one that I remember the most, I wrote this article called The Runaway Train of Late Stage Private Financing. And the punchline of it was, there were more, there were so many unicorns that you would need 10 years of IPOs in order to clear the number of unicorns. Hmm. And so like Josh Koppelman retweeted it like a bunch of other, it, it took off. And there were three of those that really drove it. And then, then I met Andrew Chen, who's now at Andreessen, who was at Uber before. And he uh, completely changed my view of the value of a blog. And he said, the ultimate value of a blog is the email address. You don't care about traffic at all. Because his goal at that time, and I'm not sure if it's changed, was to amass an email subscriber list of a million people that he would leave to his heirs because the distribution mm -hmm. power of a million emails is just absolutely gargantuan. And you can do all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff with that. And so then I started focusing on email captions. If you go to the blog now, it will pop up and ask you, um, do you want to subscribe? And 80% of the people who do subscribe, subscribe using that pop-up. And when you're talking about kind of optimizing for these channels, are you thinking about optimizing like the format of what you're writing or the content that would be interesting or like the headlines or is it a reasonably balanced mix of all of that? Yeah, so I went through a phase where I started A-B testing different blog formats. Like does, does a blog post have images? Where should those images be? Are there headers in the articles? How long should the article be? 
and mm -hmm. uh, written post on that. Do not put headers in a blog post. That instantly communicates that it's long and people will abandon. Mm -hmm. um, images, um, so page load speed is super important. Super, super, super important. When we learn this at Google, um, mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, like a 10% reduction in like page load speed translates like a 50% increase in uh, time spent on site or something. And um, so I moved from a WordPress site to a statically generated site that loads in under a second for most geographies. And I ripped mm -hmm. out all the images that were like hero images for exactly this reason. Um, mm -hmm. So speed page uh, was super important. And then uh, article length, I did a bunch of tests and you know, 40, the, the, the post of uh, the title of that analysis was this message will self-destruct in 48 seconds because mm -hmm. I had 48 seconds with a reader. And so that's when um, I have a 500 word limit for most posts. Mm -hmm. So how did you decide to write about the narrative economics piece and what has it changed about how you think about your startup stories and also your own personal brand, how you've been communicating your own story to the public? Yeah, I, um, so I first came across the paper that Schiller had written, um, which kind of led to the book. And his whole point is that um, narratives are sort of self-fulfilling and this is a really important idea because the classic case of Betamax versus VHS, which is better technology doesn't always win, has played itself out like, a, I don't know, a million times in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. And the, the point of it is that the story and the sale around a technology or an idea or a company or a person are at least as important, if not more important than the technology itself. I remember a marketing professor at grad school, he, he said, uh, he wrote an equation on the board, like on the first day, which was invention plus marketing equals innovation. The, inno the invention in and of itself does not change the world. It's getting it into people's hands and getting them excited about using it that really the combination of the two. Um, and what you find in like a lot of the hottest companies in the Valley is that the founders, uh, and Rick was no exception in this case, that the founders are able to craft a narrative that early on sort of cements the business in the, the collective psyche of whatever ecosystem they care about. And that that um, narrative becomes self-fulfilling. I'll give you a concrete example. Um, uh, there's a woman named Jen, Jen Grant and Jen Grant was the CMO at Box and she was the CMO at Looker. And I remember when um, we were interviewing her to join Looker. She told me about uh, the creative tension that needs to exist within a startup. And uh, in the really early days of Box, they were, they were an FTP replacement. So you could upload a file and somebody else could download it online as opposed to using an FTP server, which is a bit more technical. And she said, that's what the website was. The website was literally FTP replacement. But she said she would put Aaron Levy, who was the founder and the CEO on stage, and he would talk about the future of collab, the future of collaboration, and he would talk about it to like the CEO of Coca-Cola. And the idea wasn't that the CEO of Coca-Cola or whoever was in the audience was gonna go to box.com and download the FTP replacement because you know, whatever Fortune 500 CEO listening to Aaron was like, clearly the company is way too early for us to adopt us at enterprise scale, but I know where he's going. And in three or five years, whenever they get big enough, you know, I have got that brand impression, I will be ready. And in the meantime, the company is growing using uh, sort of bottom of the funnel tactics. And so that, creating that kind of narrative tension is, is super important. Um, and what you don't realize, or what a lot of people don't realize is that narrative, you, you use it every day. I mean, when you talk to the press, when you talk to your friends, when you talk to people you're going to recruit, uh, when you get up on an all hands, you know, when you're trying to close the customer, it, it's all the same narrative. And you've got to repeat it, I don't know how many millions of times before the world gets it. So, so th those narratives are really powerful for kind of pulling the future forward because it helps people see what is going to be, even if, even what is today is, is not as, you know, it's, it's a, a website or an FTP uh, service. But, but I wonder, you know, I think, I think if you look at, you know, other examples, you see, um, you know, you see Elon Musk telling really great stories and you know, that creates the capital base that allows him to 
move the company to execute on the plans. So yeah, I think that's there's there's several of those examples where things really work. I I wonder if you know how you think about when people are sort of overplaying their hand or overstating the story. So I think you know maybe you know a, a kind of a recent example might be like the WeWork uh, story where you know I think the story got like really far ahead of any reality. And, and how do you sort of balance when getting the story that far ahead is like productive or healthy and when it's actually kind of a detriment, you know, kind of to society at large, let's say even. Yeah, I mean, um, that is a tough question. I think you would rather fail the way that Adam Newman failed than the mm -hmm. other way. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, there's like a good miss and a bad miss. And the good miss is having oversold the story mm -hmm. is a better miss than having undersold the story. Right. Uh, and I, I, I'm not advocating fraud, right? Or right, anything yeah. like that. But um, it's way better to be aggressive on the narrative than to be timid and shy. Because the thing that gets people really excited is somebody with incredible ambition who inspires with hope. Mm -hmm. Uh, about really changing the world. I mean, that's really what I think draws most of us to technology is the leverage that you have and your ability to change the world, at least in this era. And so you really, if you're an investor or an employee or whoever, I think we're drawn and we're sort of magnetized to the people who are able to articulate those stories. And, uh, you know, I think maybe the thing that you need in addition to that is somebody who's able to ground that story into reality and um, sort yep. of connect the reality distortion field that, that a great storyteller is able to create and, and marry it to uh, reality. Right, right. Yeah, I, I do think you can see it, uh, you know, in like, you know, any given, I don't know, any given like a demo day from Y Combinator or something, you see some, you know, you get to look back to back at, at you know, minutes by minutes of pitching and you really do see some people really have the narrative down and they have the ability to just tell the story about the future and that, that, that magnetizes every, you know, talent and capital and everything around. So it's, it's probably one of the best things that I think that, um, you know, that Paul Graham did to help kind of young inexperienced founders is to, to really help people understand that that's okay and you can get a bit ahead of, uh, a bit ahead of the reality is really why, why you're all coming together and why you're putting that energy in it's not a lie it's just a it's an idea that you're you're trying to sort of build towards um i think yeah. uh, i think there was a question did uh actually misty was asking about rick rick are, are you are you able to join us uh, uh we had a question about sort of how the storytelling kind of your experience with storytelling in branch out and maybe hear about any of tomas's uh, reaction what, sure. what you found inspiring about working with you? Yeah, I mean, our our big vision, our story, and this is 10 years ago when the Facebook platform was open, was the idea that you could utilize your friends and your entire network to be able to find opportunity. And uh, the idea was almost an accident where I was like, you know what, I know someone at Disney, who is it? And then I'm like in, in Facebook trying to figure out who it is and there wasn't an easy interface to do that. And then they had um, created the ability to do that and no one kind of realized that you could do that on the platform and then we kind of jumped on it early. Um, but it was really this big idea of the, the whole world is connected and there's billions of people on Facebook and, uh, and LinkedIn is doing their own thing over here, but Facebook is so much bigger and more vibrant. And, and that was a story and we got there first and we got a lot of traction uh, right out of the gates. And that was super exciting. And um, we raised uh, $49 million um, over three rounds of funding. Uh, unfortunately, um, ours was a story of platform risk and that Facebook shut basically everyone off, including you know us and Zynga and everyone else from getting all that great free traffic when they went public and needed ad dollars. Uh, but at one point, Branch Out was adding 400,000 users every day for free. So it was a big vision, and um, and you know, and I appreciate Redpoint and and all our other investors getting behind us on that. 
Um, yeah, that, that was a story. That, that was the big story about we're globally connected and we have this really interesting way to, <laughs> really interesting way to, uh, to come here. Uh, we're supposed to be right now. Uh, we have this All really right. interesting way to connect the world uh, in a new way, leveraging the platform. That was a big idea. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Sweet. Right Thanks now. for sharing. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. Thanks, Rick. <laughs> um, My so, son is four and a half. Yeah. He's never had a haircut, so apparently I'm missing his first haircut right now. That, well, that's a big for, news. Thanks for spending it with that. <laughs> um, on the uh, on the idea of uh, of you know kind of owning narratives, um, there was actually a, a a tweet storm. I don't know if it, if people saw from Balaji uh, this this afternoon about where he was pointing out how Tesla actually is shutting down their PR department. They sort of have officially kind of let everybody go, and that they're gonna focus on owning their own media channel and being their own media creator. And I think it's a, an idea that um, I see a lot in, um, in the world. Uh, you know, I think, I think Square is a particularly, you know, Squ uh, Square uh, Crypto has done a particularly great job at really owning their media channel and building kind of a personality around their product in this way. Um, I wonder if this is something that uh, that you've seen as a trend, uh, if it feels like it's something that companies, you know, is, is Balaji's point is Tesla early to observe and execute on something that's going to become commonplace or other, you know, other nuances to that in the case of something like, um, uh, you know, maybe like a SaaS software company, would it have a different, uh, a different perspective on that? Yeah, I think it's probably, the culmination of of a long trend. There used to be these things called industry magazines. And so if you went mm -hmm. to computers, uh, you would go and you would get a weekly, like the Hollywood Reporter in media is, I think it's still a thing where it's just like, <clears throat> it's a magazine of literally what matters in Hollywood and all the kind of comings and goings and the people and all that kind of stuff. And that's the way that, you know, before newsletters and email and blogs, uh, people paid attention. and uh, they went away because they were replaced by, you know, TechCrunch and VentureBeat and all those kinds of things. And, but they used to carry these like product announcements, like uh, whatever, uh, Tesla is going to be releasing this new thing or Jeremy uh, mm -hmm. is releasing this new thing. And what's happened is um, there are so many of those announcements now because the universe of startups has just ballooned and swelled in a wonderful way that um, I think a lot of those media outlets are sort of overwhelmed and they can't cover it. And for a lot of people and a big fraction of the audience, it's not necessarily newsworthy news. There's some subset of that population that really cares about it. And with like the self-publishing and co content marketing, the rise of content marketing, companies are able to build audiences that are just as, well, are way more suited to their own business needs than having to go through publications. And so like, you know, like think about like the Associated Press, like that's basically just a resyndication service and none of us mm -hmm. go to the AP, <laughs> you know, we go to Twitter right. <laughs> or whatever news aggregator we have. Um, and so, I, you know, I think a lot of those sort of trade publications have died and this is kind of the consequence of that. Um, and, and maybe the other thing that's really mm -hmm. important for SaaS companies But even, is, I think if you were to take You go ahead. I think my internet is a little shaky, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, yeah. I think um, maybe it was HubSpot that kind of catalyzed this wave of content marketing um, and how impactful it can be. And it's really sort of led to this notion of like product-led growth. And um, if you think about customer acquisition as a funnel, maybe what's happening, and I'm just um, spitballing here, is that the role of marketing and customer acquisition has basically moved up into the funnel where the company actually has to own the very top of the funnel now, where they, they want to own it because it's so strategic in driving product-led growth, a hypothesis, I don't know. So do you think that companies will be focused on their blog as a way to sort of own that, that like when you say content marketing, you mean basically posting, having a blog and kind of telling more stories about 
the company? Yeah, I mean, you definitely see it in the engineering world, like the Uber engineering blog, the Google engineering blog. I think, you know, the yeah. I've been told like the those engineering blogs are more highly trafficked than any other part of those companies, uh, content marketing, right. camp, you know, and they're fantastic recruiting tools and they spin off companies and all this kind of stuff, right? And the narrative that that's, be, that's being crafted there is really about technology superiority. And that's just as important for engineering mm -hmm. recruiting as it is for investor relations um, and everything yep. in between. Uh, and so, you know, are people going to are other departments going to start writing about this? I, I think it's sort of inevitable that, that we would. And so, so are, is every SaaS company actually going to have a media arm attached to it? That, that's kind of, you know, maybe it's overstating, but that's kind of how Vology poses it. Well, they already have events and like virtual events, like all of them are now starting to produce virtual events because one, it's the only way of creating leads, but two, it's actually a super impactful way of doing leads. Um, yeah, I think, I think, I think they do already. I mean, I guess the question is, I, I guess the leap, the, I, I haven't read the tweet storm, so maybe the leap is that they own all of their, actually, I, so, sorry, maybe you can fill me in. What What is the leap from a current like product marketing team that owns PR and comms that like does dissemination of the content plus writes about what's going on? What What is that leap that he's talking about? I assume... I assume that the distinction or the leap is that um, I think he's proposing that the company has to own its own distribution on that. So kind of just like you were saying, you want to have the blog with the email capture and have that direct relationship. And I think, you know, like Andrew wants to get his million emails. I think the point is you don't, as a PR team at Tesla, you don't want to be dependent on convincing, I don't know, Wall Street Journal that the thing you have is interesting enough. You should just own the, um, the direct relationship with people who might be interested in such yeah. a thing. So I, I think that's already happened. Ownership of the media channel. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, if you think about like just... any. Sorry, my internet. Sorry, <laughs> there's a little late. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> Everybody's on. <answering. laughs> no, no, please go. Please I think it's already happened. happened. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think most modern SaaS companies, like they're focused on the list, the the sizes of the email list, the 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 quality of those lists, how engaged those lists are, you know, really sophisticated product marketers map out the customer lifecycle journey and put content along each step of that. And um, that's really sort of the asset that they're building. Um, and so do you see, th how early is that built when you're like, are you seeing a company come in at the seed stage and they've already got a little bit of that going or at series A, they've, they've started to really build that engine out or they're kind of like hypothesizing what it's gonna look like. How, how does that actually fit into a company lifecycle? Well, I mean, if you're an open source company, like let's say you're a bunch of engineers coming out of Lyft or Uber, like you already have that list and it's basically your GitHub distro list and your Slack community mm -hmm. around whatever project. And so like that's a huge strategic advantage that you've basically built on the back of somebody else's marketing dollar. Um, uh, but in the SaaS world, the there is no list at the seed stage. At the A stage, there's probably no list because even if you're like a 20 or 50 K ACV that you're N on the total number of customers is pretty small, but between the A and the B, you typically start to hire like a product marketer and a demand generation function because you're starting to scale to go to market. You want to drive enough leads. And maybe it's at that point that you implement Marketo and then you start really understanding what's going on with your, with your email subscriber list and you start caring about your social media subscribers and all that kind of stuff. So that, it's probably between the A and the B. Mm -hmm. Actually, um, Nadia was chiming in on chat about how this plays out at Lyft. Do you want to, I'm so curious, Nadia, do you want to talk a little bit about the engineering blog and the data that you were mentioning on chat? What's yeah, I mean, I think it's super aligned with what Tomas was saying, but we have an engineering blog, but it's not actually maintained, I think, by marketing. I think it's like kind of self-run by the tech teams. And there was a launch I worked on a couple of years ago where we wanted to make a point of just sort of documenting it and having an engineering perspective. And it's like not the sort of the norm. I was in product marketing at the time, but I befriended like a recruiter and a TPM and we were able to dig up the data. And it just was like totally mind boggling how much of a positive impact it had on like the top of funnel and recruiting, like exactly to your point. But I, I think it's like totally underutilized, even though it's like a super powerful channel because it's not, I think like conventionally like a PR or a marketing sort of 
thing, but it's, it's super powerful. Yeah, I think uh, uh, somebody taught me this. I don't remember who it was, but at the basis of all marketing is building trust and different people, you build trust differently, right? With an engineer, um, the way you build trust is you show them your GitHub repo. And then you're like, oh, okay, you're a real engineer. Okay, we can talk. What, what is it that you mm -hmm. want to do? Um, but with a marketer, it's different. Like if you sell to uh, a marketer, like uh, if you read um, how to influence, how to make friends and influence people, like social proof is actually hugely important for lots of people. And so if you look at websites, like a lot of them have like, these are the five amazing companies that use us. That's an example of social proof. And that's a different way of influencing somebody and building trust because by proxy. Um, and so, you know, if you think about all the different segments or the personas that you need to, within a particular company that you really want care about, each one of them is going to have to have trust built in a slightly different way. And that's why the engineering blog is so powerful because that's exactly what it does for engineers. Yeah, and in terms of life cycle, um, I think Doug had a follow-up question here about how early companies might deal with this. Do you want to chime in, Doug, if you're there? Sure. So the uh, question was, yeah, I guess at, at, the, at the seed stage, very small team, who's, who's taking the time to kind of write these posts and figure out, you know, what's impactful for community and cross-posting or deciding what kind of strategy makes sense early on to build a, a good blog? Did you hear that okay? I think the question was around kind of on the early seed stage, who's responsible for this? If they're already starting to try to do that, is that is that somebody that might be on staff already? Yeah, so um, marketing is not the creator. Marketing is the megaphone. Mm -hmm. And so um, what you really would love to see it come from the founder. Uh, and the and you might even say it's a it's a negative signal if you've got if you sort of outsource that role. Yeah, the other thing that somebody else said to me, which is a different mental model, which is either you spend half of your time on marketing or you spend zero. But if you spend anything in between, mm -hmm. you're not going to get any bang for your buck. Um, and I think the the point of that, coupled with the idea that it should come from the founder, is marketing to work has to be authentic. Like if ever you know, used car salesman, inauthentic, sales not going to go through. So that's why I like the idea of like narratives are so powerful because if the, if you start a company and you're solving a problem that you felt or um, you're really sort of attached to it, the narrative is so powerful because you're speaking from experience. You have that authenticity. It's really easy to build trust. It can be mission driven. Like people, people align themselves to that kind of authenticity. Um, and so it's really difficult like, for you to have a founding team and then for you to hire somebody who's gonna come in and craft that narrative in a super authentic way. It's possible, but it's incredibly rare to find a marketer who's so good that they can create a story on their own, but make it seem as if it's coming from somebody else. Like it's, you know, so you really want it to come from the founder. And look, there, there are lots of different ways. Like I, I don't mean to imply that the very best founders are the loudest ones, right? Um, in fact, uh, there's some very quiet founders who might be engineer, you know, engineers who are just very quiet, but they're super, they're super genuine, right? Like uh, we're investors in HashiCorp and um, Mitchell Hashimoto is, you know, you meet him as like a quiet, soft-spoken guy, uh, but he's had a ridiculous impact on the developer ecosystem. And it's not because he's pounding his chest and getting up in front of the stage and talking about how amazing he is. He's just, he's able to build these really terrific products and then, um, tell people about them in, a, in an authentic way that gets millions of engineers super excited. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about like what are the best examples of this that you've seen? Like, what what are the founders doing? Kind of give us the play by play because I'm I'm curious because it ties into a lot of talk these days about building in public and how you should really like expose your story very organically as you're building a company and that becomes its own form of marketing. Like, what have you seen in your portfolio really work? Boy, that is a good question. Well, we can do a bunch of different examples. Um, 
maybe we can just do a bunch of different examples from the ecosystem. So <clears throat> you've got the Mitchell, you know, Hashimoto story, which is he builds six different open source tools. Each of them gets uh, to a huge audience and then he begins to commercialize them with uh, his co-founder uh, and it creates a huge business. You've got Nick uh, and Anthony at Gainsight who um, created the narrative of customer success and basically used venture dollars to um, create a community around this, these people that had no shepherd before, right? Uh, and so it, he started with this enormous conference and Nick got on stage. And if you know Nick, like he's got this incredible personality and he's warm and uh, he's a very outgoing leader. And so he was able to become sort of the, the leader of that movement and sort of catalyze that movement. That's another way of doing it. Um, what's a third example? a third really good example that's a different way of doing that you see people doing this kind of building in public where they're they're sharing parts of their story kind of the, the successes and failures along the way because i feel like we've we've heard some some writers talk more about how that's a, a more common trend these days that they're seeing especially i think in open source communities yeah, I mean, there's way more founders sort of open sourcing their pitch decks. That didn't happen 10 years ago. I mean, pitch decks were sort of the sacrosanct document that was, you know, mm -hmm. a shibboleth between the VC and the um, and the the founder. I think that's definitely happening. But I don't think it's so much about like company building as it is sort of reinforcing the narrative of the business. Um, one thing that's really happened that sort of exploded is the rise of like trade press using books as, as like leave behinds and content marketing. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at the number of business books that are being published, I haven't seen a chart, but they must have exploded. Right. Um, uh, that's definitely being used. How, how did you think about that when you were writing a book? What were, what were sort of your kind of goals with, with writing? Yeah, I mean, the first was just to establish some credibility. And the second was really, I, I co-authored it with uh, Frank, who's, who is the CEO and at Looker and it, it was a fantastic marketing tool. So we would go to a new city, we would email 50 of these books to prospects uh, and invite them to a dinner and literally like, I don't know, 45 of them would show up wow. after having received that gift. And then the conversion rates from those, we call them look and tells uh, were really high, right? Um, uh, you know, and like the, the HubSpot guys, uh, that was the third example I was looking for. Like HubSpot was another one where they literally just wrote about a new way of thinking about marketing, which was this inbound marketing, and they happened to have the software they made it seem that way. And so that, that was sort of another way of doing it. They were basically practicing what they were preaching. And so then again, you had this sort of like authenticity that was really strong and powerful. But yeah, so I think, I think, I think books are really great. Um, I think virtual events like this are definitely going to be the, um, the marketing of like the next five years. Mm hmm yeah, it seems like there's a lot of a lot of opportunity to get new messages out and actually get a lot of like real time feedback. So, you know, we've gotten a lot of a lot of positive feedback from people who participate in kind of what they've learned from the process. Um, I wonder, you know, kind of on that note, and I, I do want to be sensitive to time because I know we are wrapping up on the hour that we we'd allocated. Uh, we don't want to run over too much, uh, but um, you know, kind of on that point, I wonder, you know, Tom, what. What are the uh, what are the stories that you're trying to tell these days? Or kind of what you know you've sort of you've been telling a lot of different stories uh, over the years, and I think you sort of you know used your writing early to establish some credibility and brand within venture capital, and you've sort of doubled down on that success over time. And you know, kind of looking forward, do you is it going to be kind of continue to exercise those muscles, or do you think you'll take it in some new directions? Or what what are your goals these days? Yeah, I think we writing? really. Um... So the first goal of the blog and the writing is really to celebrate um, all of the wonderful things that are happening in startup land. That's number one. And I do it because um, many people have given me knowledge. And so the least, like the very least that I can do is to share that with as many people mm -hmm. as possible. That's one story. I think the second story is to tell the story of Redpoint and the firm that we're building. Uh, which has been, uh, it's go it will be my life's work. I mean, been there for 12 years already. And, you know, the story of Redpoint is that we're a, we're a venture firm that's been around for 20 years. And um, we call ourselves Redpoint because it's a climbing term. 
and it's about summoning in a mountain for the first time. And that's the way that we view ourselves as partners to founders to summit a mountain uh, for the first time. And that we have been fortunate enough to partner with many of the iconic companies of uh, this generation. Uh, you know, whether it's like Snowflake or Twilio or Stripe or Zendesk or HashiCorp or Looker. Um, and that, uh, that we, you know, and I think those messages really kind of come together because almost all of us are founders and almost all of us are operators. And so the combination of one, wanting to learn, two, really participating in the ecosystem and wanting to give back, and then three, uh, being able to help founders, at least you know, with the capital and the board and the advice, it's just a really nice uh, combination of things. So yeah. I definitely have to work on that messaging. It's a, uh, you know, I got to crispen it up a bit, but that's uh, that's great. That's yeah. the message. It's w wonder, wonderful perspective. And I think it's a, it's, I mean, the message of sharing is a great one to lead with because I think that's sort of why we all get together and, uh, and love to, love to invite people like you and love to learn from you because it's that, that sharing process and the feedback loop that it creates for all of us to learn uh, is kind of what, why we do all this. Um, so I, I do want to uh, move towards wrapping up, but, and we do have one final question that we're going to ask you. And I, I think we prepped you on this, <laughs> but just in case we did, did, did we, I think we did, right? Okay. You don't have I to think answer so. right now. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make a, just a, a few quick closing announcements. Um, first of all, thank you so much for joining us, Tom. We loved learning from you. Everybody's talking about it in chat, how they can't believe how the time just flew by and can't believe the hour is over already. So we really appreciate you spending the time with us. So thank you. Oh, it's a privilege. Thank you very much. Um, and so I wanted to mention to everybody here that we've got um, a few future town halls already scheduled. If you go to highlighter.com slash discover, you can find some of our upcoming town halls. Um, and we'll have some more questions uh, for Tom that we can um, loop you all in with on Twitter because a bunch of stuff has come up in the chat that we haven't gotten a chance to get to. Uh, coming up, we have Scott Belsky, uh, who's going to talk about his book, The Messy Middle. And we've got Annie Duke next week for uh, her book, How to Decide. So she's launching her book uh, next week and we'll be, we'll be there, uh, is it launch day or the day after launch day uh, with Annie Duke. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, so we're ready for the conclusion question. <laughs> um, so we've spent a lot of tonight kind of asking you questions and getting to, to um, you know, get all of our questions answered. We want to sort of turn the tables now and, you know, hear from you. What is your question that's top of mind? What are you most curious about? Uh, and what are the things that you, you know, sort of the big questions for you in the world these days? Yeah, I think the biggest question that I would love to hear people's perspectives on is um, what, what entrepreneurs will want from venture capitalists five years from now? I'm really curious. The venture industry is actually going through a fundamental transformation that has a lot of analogs to how private equity evolved in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and it's just becoming more formal and bigger. And so the expectations that founders have of uh, investors are changing. And so it's, for me, it's really important to understand mm -hmm. how those expectations are changing so that we can anticipate them and serve them well. That's great. Well, that, that's a great question. I'm sure there's a lot of entrepreneurial energy in here that we'll have stuff to weigh in on. And, uh, and it's a great one because obviously our networks on Twitter would care about sort of chiming in on that. So we'll, we'll kick off a thread on Twitter and we can, uh, we can try to chime in and, and keep the conversation going with you. So awesome. Thanks so much for spending the time, Tomas. Really appreciate it. Thanks. This was a blast. Take care. Bye. Yeah. And you. Mm -hmm.